Welcome to Access to Art. We're outside of Gallery 360 in South Minneapolis on 50th Street for an opening of paintings by Maureen Welter. We'll go inside in a little bit. But tonight's first segment deals with dancer choreographer Rosie Samus, who created a work, Have Gun Will Shoot, using improvisation, dance, mixed media, and basic training to explore issues involving military, patriotism, and the transforming of regular people into killers. Access to Art correspondent John Aker, after seeing the performance, spoke with Rosie at the Ritz Theater. The work that I do is based in dance improvisation and I was really interested in um, soldiers and primarily the soldiers that were in the Afghanistan and Iraq. We have a, a show called Have Gun Will Shoot and um, the, the premise as far as being a dancer in it, I see it as um, kind of the military experience. And my interest was in what it was to be a soldier. Um, it sort of developed from that more into a piece about women soldiers. It's about the cohesiveness of both getting through something difficult with a group of people, maybe not entirely understanding exactly why all the time. It's also about getting through something even personally, just pushing yourself to boundaries. You dance and you move because there aren't words to describe what it is that you're, you're trying to do. And I think that it, it creates a visceral effect um, so that people can actually feel physically um, what you're doing. Dance can give people an emotion in their muscles. I mean, everybody has muscle memory that, you know, they see someone doing a push-up and you can imagine what it's like to be doing a push-up. Especially with the, the level of physical activity, I mean, it definitely creates a bond between all the dancers. The dancers that I'm working with right now actually all come from very different backgrounds. I feel like I could take the other women in the production and we could do anything together. You know, like, I, I know they'll be there. One of them is a sort of hardcore ballerina. Deborah, who's in the piece, she is an improvisation and modern dance teacher. One of them is a theater art artist mainly an actress. Um, one of them's background is mostly in sort of jazz and modern. I come out in white and get bound by flags. And I think it's interesting to allow the physiology of the boundness of the flags to inform my state of being. It's intense physically as, as well as emotionally. Half of this piece is choreographed and half of it is improvisation structure. The development always starts with improvisation. So in this piece in particular, I actually started with the body. So we worked with improvisation using like the bones that um, are defensive and then working from those areas to create movement. I have to use the dress to, to kind of create this sense of worn outness, tatteredness. Yet, I play, well, what I'm playing with is this kind of Lady Macbeth. Thousands, two, three, thousands, two, four. Well, I took a class with the ROTC, 
and I actually came up with movement from the class. Rosie is a character who is going through the experience of sort of realizing what that she has the power to kill other people and, and dealing with that experience. We follow the character from their sort of their pledge to their country and signing up to the military through going to war through sort of the realization of what it is to be female and to have the power to kill other people and to watch people being killed and what that does to a person. She's not trying to make a, a statement as to whether war is good or bad or whether you should be patriotic or not. She really was trying to really hone in on what is the experience of someone who is 18, 19, you know, going to a foreign land where everything's different, um, into a place that they don't know, and what is that like? In watching the women that were in the ROTC, in the class that I took, and sort of because they're a smaller population, sort of their camaraderie was different than that with the guys. Thousand, four, six, thousand, four, seven, thousand. There's a physical process that, you know, I mean, first of all, like you get your head shaved, like there are all these things that happen to your physical body, like you, you know, you have to do these things, you're, you're absolutely pushed to your physical limit. And so, and that's what we experience, dancing, it's the same thing, it's just translated and we're, you know, making choices about it. To me, it's a huge challenge, like to get, to be in that amount of control of your body, not only to physically exactly do something, but to express something through it. You see a movie about the army or war, if you hear things about Iraq, all these things, there's, there's a male, um, there's just something that comes into people's minds and I think that it's so important, it's so important that Deborah has this role of this um, Miss America, you know, um, seductive, patriotic, you know, Statue of Liberty and it's so important that we're all women and that we are um, talking about this experience too. It reflects how I feel which is conflicted. And through that I can, I can explore my conflict about this country, about how I feel so strongly about how much potential it has, yet I feel with the kind of strong arm of this under the American flag type of thing that we do actions that I don't agree with. And for me, the everyday picking up the paper, reading about somebody else who's died. Um, every day that I've been doing the show, I think about that and um, it doesn't stop. I find it horrible, but um, I didn't want to take the perspective with the dance of being an anti-war dance. I just wanted to show what I think about that. MISNA is a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting Arab American culture and giving a voice to Arab Americans. They also put out a literary journal, also called MISNA. They host an annual Arab film festival and they teach classes in the Arabic language. Access to art correspondent Beth Peloff recently visited a launch party for the newest issue of MISNA. <laughs> I hear you screaming, I am Christian, I am Druze, I am Muslim, I am this or that. I look at you and I see Arab. There really weren't any publications in the United States of Arab American writing and so we felt that we wanted to have our own voice and we weren't seeing it other places so we wanted to create it ourselves. I can understand how they divided our lands but not how they divided our hearts. Our people were one but now claim to be many. I'm Catherine Haddad. I'm the executive director and co-founder of MISNA. And we are an Arab American uh, arts organization. We publish a literary journal and we also hold Arabic classes and do a film festival and lots of other activities. Damp heft of silence hung in barracks empty fields. Flames licked down Osviachim's rails. Birthday celebration for the damned. Mizna, uh, the word itself, means a, a rain cloud in the desert. 
it's a rain cloud that, you know, is protective of the caravan in its journey. So it's, the Mizna is protective, it protects you in the heat of the desert. Mizna started uh, as a journal in um, 1999, we published our first journal. We have lots of other issues out in the lobby, but I think this one um, is probably one of our most beautiful. Mizna is a great forum and venue for me to write because it's a, an organization, organization that reflects my um, background and uh, it gives us a voice here in the community. For the magazine uh, to, 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 to represent uh, us in, a, in an honest way and in a more um, serious way and it's just great. There's so much misunderstanding about Arab community, about Arab issues and so I think that when writers, I hope at least when writers send their, their material to us, that level of feeling like okay if my writing isn't understood, it's not that they don't understand the context of it or the politics of it or whatever, that maybe I'll be judged on um, my writing. When the Israelis finally agreed to a ceasefire, we all thought it was mercifully over. Then my mother called and said the Israelis had hit al Manara again, needing the darkness for their final attack on Lebanon. When the Israeli invasion of Lebanon happened, um, all of us felt the need to do something, help with something, say something, write something about the injustice of what was going on. People were blogging about it, people were writing about it. Um, there was so much coming out at that time about Lebanon and we thought it would be really important and interesting to gather those writings together and to put it in an issue that's, that's about what was happening, to record it. That cab driver had been very wrong. And now his son would know this from his father's shattered face as he looked at Beirut's new craters or at the damaged lighthouse. The boy would have his own thoughts on war. They would not be the same as mine. The mispresentation of this war is just uh, is a sham for, uh, for the American mainstream media. So when a medium like uh, a magazine like Mizna to, to give voices to the, the people who actually know something about <laughs> this conflict and they lived it, they felt it, they, you know, their family had been affected. We walk where trees stood, now sands blow soldiers blind to what they raise, piles rise and evening mothers gather bread. We really felt like, okay, all of the pieces in Mizna are so serious. Um, even my dad said once, doesn't anybody ever write about <laughs> something happy. You know, there's good things that happen in the Middle East too. Why is, why is it so depressing? The lead actor or actress somehow went to Lebanon and come back a changed person. <laughs> As if you couldn't do it in Cairo. <laughs> there's a lot of serious issues obviously and people writing about serious things and we would like to be able to break it up sometimes and have people write something a little lighter um, that, that's, that's meaningful too obviously, not just fluff nothing. If he was a school dropout and no future to look up to, he came back with education and speaking a beautiful accent. <laughs> it was freedom with endless possibilities. So our relatives wonder whether we, Arab woman, Asian man, match, or will make it wonder whether we will collide the way Arabic reads right to left, then top to bottom, while kanji slides top to bottom, then right to left. We are in that same tradition of uh, you know, Asian American or African American, or, um, Native American writing, which is exploring today um, what's happening in America to Arabs. People are roots proud in the soil of these shores, knowing our parents will finally unpack their suitcases when our children take shelter in our arms the way I find shelter in yours. It has grown a lot, this whole form of Arab American writing. And Isna, I think, is, is really lucky and fortunate and happy to be a part of that growth. That night, I went to my balcony and opened the Beirut box. I took out the photo of El Manara and aired it out to free it of the stench of Minnesota mold. And I hung it up on the wall, a photo of one home kept safe all these years in another.
Here we are at an opening inside now with Maureen Welter at Gallery 360. But first, I just want to ask a quick question of Laurie Moret, who's much of the brains and bronze of Gallery 360. And how often do you have these openings? About every six weeks, we change our shows over um, this, in this gallery space. But we also have uh, these uh, five-foot shows, which we show a lot of emerging artists' work. How many folks are in the general overall uh, stable of artists for 360? Um, I, I bet maybe 200 at any one time. Excellent. And now, uh, Maureen, yes. beautiful paintings. And uh, how many years of work does this represent in the room? This is about a year's work. And you mentioned on the card that there's a lot of French themes, and what's especially engaging about that to you? Oh, well, I used to be a French teacher, and so it's part of my heart and soul, I think, to do French themes. They're beautiful. Thank you very much for sharing your work with us, and uh, go say hi to all your fans. Thank you. Minneapolis Theatre Garage was founded in the late 1980s by an actor who was also involved in the real estate profession to provide a venue for theatre companies that might not otherwise have a stage. Over the years, they've shown dozens, even hundreds, of mainstream and very experimental shows, and he's been a regular venue for Minneapolis Fringe Festival for years. Access to art scourer of the aesthetic underbelly Carrie Volk recently visited the theater garage and saw a production by Burning House Theater Company. Uh, hi, I'm Hosmer Brown, uh, the owner of the Minneapolis Theater Garage. I built it in uh, back in the early 80s or mid 80s and opened in May of 88. What, what I was looking for was a, uh, a multi-use building and this is an example of adaptive reuse um, it was an old garage, it became something else, and then it becomes something else again. Uh, so I uh, divided it into retail and theater. The theater takes about half of the building. So it, it's a unique building, and, it, and that's one of the reasons it became a theater, because it fit the needs to be multi-use. I could lease out the other spaces um, to have some financial coverage to keep this going. And so that's worked out okay. I had to go through the entire building, and. I did a lot of it myself, um, and I have the scars to prove it. <laughs> so, productions, they contact us one way or another, and then we schedule it out, and they come on their appointed times, and, and then they're kind of they're on their own, you know, in here. I provide the space and uh, some equipment, but they're, uh, they're free to have at it and pursue their dreams. I put my foot down on the thingy. You put your foot down on the thing. And I steer with the, the steering machine. The steering machine. <laughs> <laughs> This is someone who watched over me as our second show here at the Theater Garage. So uh, for this first full season that we're doing this year, 0607 um, is our first foray into the Theater Garage. Burning House Group was started back in 1994 uh, as a collective of uh, theater artists from the University of Minnesota's MFA uh, acting program. We were mainly active in the mid-90s. Uh, we've done a range of productions from interpretations of classics uh, to contemporary scripts to uh, we've done quite a few original productions as well. Oh, the play is based on the memoirs of Brian Keenan. Uh, Brian Keenan was an Irish journalist uh, who was held in captivity in Beirut in the late 80s, I believe it was 89 to 85, for four and a half years. You know, one of the greatest obstacles for the actors, I'd say, is the chains that they had to, <laughs> had to wear the whole time. The, the chains are just another character in the play. They really speak to the situation uh, that these characters were placed in. I think what the play speaks to is the, is the manic nature of the depression and the trying to cope and the trying to use their imagination and with games and, and imagining themselves in other places. Um, uh, but it, it sinks to that level of despair quite often. Uh, so it was a real obstacle and challenge to try to balance that, the despair with the hope, I'd say. Um, because that's the only way they survived is, is, is through having hope. And that's the other, I think that's the other great thing about the play is that it, it um, 
You know, it's a play that takes place in the Middle East um, in a time that was just fairly similar to what we're going through now in the Middle East um, with the tensions, but the play doesn't really speak to those Middle East politics. It, it mainly speaks to the politics of just culture in general because we see the, the British character and the Irish character going at each other because they have such a long history of animosity towards each other. Well, listen, get that out of your head. For if they put him down, they can put us down as well. Dogs together to be shot. As a theater organization, it's a, uh, it's a question that you always have to go back to. Um, and as an arts organization in particular, um, you're always trying to define what, uh, what service art brings to the community. You know? We're not trying to be, be didactic and say, this is, this is how you should think. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think that's sort of what we're trying to provide is just, just an opportunity to reflect on, on, on what we see in our world today. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm one guy that put together this facility and, uh, you know, it's, it's serving people, I guess, to the best of its ability or my ability. Uh, people are going to continue to pursue doing live theater in the arts. They need to have a place where they can, they've got a shot at some commercial viability that uh, the theater garage provides. It's not the perfect venue for everything, nor should it be. Um, but it's able to maintain itself. It's been doing, I think, what it's supposed to do, so I'm happy with that. Spout Press is an all-volunteer literary organization that specializes in experimental writing and publishes people who might otherwise not get published at all. Founded in 1989, they print experimental writing, mostly from the upper Midwest area, but they've also gone into book publishing. Megan Cullen, Access to Art correspondent, went to the launch party for their newest book called Lush, a poetry anthology and cocktail guide and she spoke with one of the three original editor-publishers of Spout. I watched the crossed ankles of the woman next to me on the couch, feet propped on the coffee table, ankle bracelet with a small smoking gun. She isn't talking, but sipping a martini with a big green olive. I the scene for writing and for art in Minneapolis is so rich. There's so many people doing such great work, but it's pretty fragmented, and we kind of see Spout Press as a vehicle for community. But the way she doesn't smile, sips her drink, I can tell she'd rather just play with her olive. The book that we are promoting tonight is called Lush. It's for sale at the table right back there. If you have not participated in the interactive poetry media station... Our press is right kind of heavily table, oriented toward putting on shows and having events. There's a lot of potential for collaboration that's still untapped. I mean, it's happening in a lot of places, but there's still a lot more that could happen. The apparent failure of the polka to restore balance to the universe wipes teenage lovers off of my list of disappointments. And what is Spot Press? It's been running since 1989. We started out publishing just a magazine. We publish a couple books a year, and we still do the magazine. And we focus on experimental writing that isn't getting much publication elsewhere, um, national writers, but also a lot of regional writing. A poem by one of my favorite Minnesota poets. Her name is Joanna Rawson. Yeah. Oh, you love her. You know her, you love her. We wanted to make a book that had serious poems in it, had serious literature in it, and we got a lot of great submissions from around the country. The wash has been drying on the line for three days. The air is shot through with verga, sodden. The sky's low slung. So but we also wanted to make a fun book, a, a book that we could throw a party for, and a book that, uh, book that we could sit around and have drinks with. Isn't it enough that I have to walk around each day with the other big blue birds? Well, not a one amongst you has ever noticed that it's obvious. My blue is bluer. And what's more, it fits me. Nice. Lush is a book that took us a long time to make. Surprisingly, it's a, it's a collection of poems, and each poem mentions a cocktail. So in addition to 
The palms, there's a recipe for the cocktail. Anonymous space age bachelor pad extravagance, three, four time, the velvet whirl of scarlet pleats serve cold. We like to partner with other organizations so that we draw from two crowds, but also so that we make more community in the local art scene. And we thought Afternoon Records was a good fit because they kind of are doing it on their own and they're doing it their own way. You're not going to let her in. You've locked her in with her perfume and cheap novels and her deep need for trouble. She's the one calling to you through a keyhole and then sneaking away to squirm out a window and tear her silk dress. Our, our motto for Spout has always been stay small and survive. And uh, every year we get together and have a big planning meeting and we plan uh, what we're going to do in the next five years. And we've never accomplished it once because there's no boss and there's, there are no deadlines. No one tells us we have to have something out by a certain time. No one um, gets paid at Spout. We're just doing it because we love to do it. Spout Press is, has just become a nonprofit. Which means that if you give us money, we'll write a, a receipt on like the back of a cocktail napkin, and then you can, you can send that in with your taxes. We hope to publish two to three books a year, and to put out a couple issues of our magazine a year, and maybe put on six to eight events in a year, because we're all about the parties. I love Gallery 360. Mary and Lori always get a lot of people in here, as you can see tonight from Marine Show. And what's especially important and possibly unique about what they do here is it's a gallery showcasing new, inventive, exciting artists as well as uh, established talent. But they also have a lot of gift items, and a lot of artists don't like that kind of collision and compromise, they say. But to Mary's credit, she makes it possible to show and support new and emerging artists by having a gift shop that really engages the people who come in and may not have $200, $500, $1,000 for an artwork, but they can support by buying a postcard, a break an article of clothing. It's a great and visionary idea, and it's here at 360 in Minneapolis. I think that's it for this episode of Access to Art. You can see us every Tuesday night, 8.30, Channel 17, on the Minneapolis Television Network, the only thing you should be watching. Yeah. That'd be nice, actually, if it was a little ecosystem. You had a little aesthetic sea monkeys assessing the value of modern art in here, looking out, getting shot, wearing berets, acting snooty, clinking cocktails, wearing high heels, pre pretending that they're the next movement. Why not? If that's what it comes down to, everything is art. We could just forget all the trappings, save a lot of money, and buy a nice plant. This access to art. Here I'll tell you the worst joke of all. How many actors does it take to screw in a light bulb? One hundred! One to screw it in, and ninety-nine of these who say, That should be me up there! Use that joke Did you use it last time? I'm using it everywhere. <laughs> Notice I up the number of people. Yeah, the ego grows each time. <laughs>